Coming up on Daily Tech News Show, the Galaxy S10 fingerprint reader glitch, cool new accessibility products get Microsoft funding, and why Netflix is not doomed. Don't listen to those people. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, October 17th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just talking about science fairs and history fairs and then the technologies that keep your bird from running away on Good Day Internet. If you would like to hear that conversation and more, of course, you want to become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google has discontinued Google Clips, its small camera that used AI to automatically take pictures. Google first introduced Clips back at I.O. in 2017. Uh, we hardly knew you, seriously, mm -hmm. literally. We, yeah. yeah. Say hello to reader in heaven. A listing appeared on Amazon for their as yet unannounced NVIDIA Shield Pro, which has since been removed. Along with the $199 price tag, uh, upgrades appear to include the new Tegra X1 Plus chip and support for Dolby Vision HDR, plus a AAA battery-powered remote with motion-activated uh, backlit buttons and an IR blaster. A new Google Voice update for iOS adds better support for Siri. So if you're using iPhone, you can now use Siri to send messages and place calls using your Google Voice number outside of the app. Uh, you have to manually enable the feature in your iOS settings to make that work. Uh, but Google's own assistant can also send messages over, over Google Voice or place phone calls. You just have to have that app running. Mark Zuckerberg spoke at Georgetown University on Thursday. Among his remarks, he said that Facebook has 35,000 people working on security and implied that the budget is around $5 billion. He also said that banning political ads altogether would favor incumbents and defended the decision to not fact check political ads as a way to encourage more political discourse. Hashtag portal to <laughs> Yeah. Anyone? Anyone? Or All right, let's talk a little bit more about the fingerprint reader on the Samsung phone. Uh, indeed, Tom, Samsung confirmed to Reuters that a fingerprint uh, that if a fingerprint is registered on a Galaxy S10 device with a screen projector in place, it can then be unlocked by any fingerprint. According to Samsung uh, support posts, this is because of some gel style screen protectors have a pattern that is picked up along with the fingerprints and then registers the biometric information. Samsung says it will release a software patch soon. Well, that's a relief. Yeah, uh, I, I find this fascinating because it's not, if you use the, the default screen protector that Samsung gives you, this doesn't work. So that makes sense. Samsung tested it with their own screen protector. But these cheap $2 gel protectors apparently cause a pattern that makes the fingerprint register go, well, that must be part of the fingerprint. And then when the finger is not the same behind it. It's still seeing enough of that gel pattern to go, well, I, I see enough of the pattern that that works. Let's unlock the phone. So, I mean, the workaround is pretty easy. Don't register your fingerprint with the screen protector in place. Uh, but this is a fascinating thing that Samsung maybe should have anticipated, but didn't. Uh, and, uh, and shows some of the limits for how it tells a finger apart, right? It's it's not that this is a problem with it telling fingers. It's just it can't tell what's a finger and what's not when you're registering, which is usually <laughs> not a big deal because you usually don't put anything but a finger over that fingerprint sensor. Yeah, you know, and it also kind of raises some of the questions about where you put the fingerprint sensor and the fact that some of these, you know, the Apple went away with it or, or went away from it in the iPhone because, uh, you know, they, they had more faith in Face ID than they did the the thumbprint. Uh, I think that this is, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going to resist jumping on the, like, LOL Samsung uh, train here, but I do wonder whether or not they're going to be able to solve it through a software patch. I I would guess they're able to like go and do some some quick training with whatever machine learning algorithm they're using and and differentiate uh the the kind of pattern that these screens show. Like that is something that they should theoretically be able to do and apparently they think they can do it. Uh so so that's that's an advance. This is a good thing in in the longer run because it makes this more secure and that it really will work with fingerprints and not, uh, not with other things. Yeah. Uh, but all of these biometrics do have 
certain weirdnesses. I mean, there, there was a story out today that the the Google face recognition, the face unlock for the Pixel 4 will work with your eyes closed. And a lot mm -hmm. of people are upset about that because one of the things that you do to make sure that someone can't force you to unlock your phone is close your eyes, right? Uh, and that won't work. Pixel 4 yeah. is but still unlocked. Or if you're asleep or comatose or something that that's that stuff that's something you don't want someone to have control over i wonder you know it's it's obvious that samsung would not be able to test a bunch of third-party covers that they didn't make at the same time it and and justin i'm with you on this like it's not sort of like a ha-ha thing because it's the yeah. problem that nobody just probably thought that this would happen but at the same time you know, how much would a cover that is likely to be bought by somebody because it's cheaper or, I don't know, aesthetically pleasing or is the right color, that sort of thing, going to kind of ruin one of the privacy, the big privacy security features of the phone itself? Yeah. Well, and also it's like whether or not they were able to test it or we should feel that they were negligent in their testing. If you have a security feature that, by the way, controls payment and uh, all, all sorts of other stuff if it's unlocked then you know uh, you have you have to understand that the mechanism by which you are using to guard that is faulty like or well is, and and i i would further say you should always assume that because yeah, uh, your that, your thing is for sure your 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 code that you could enter into the phone which is the other way of protecting the phone instead of a biometric could all is actually less secure than this. It's it's easier for someone to socially engineer that out of you than to socially engineer your face or your fingerprint. Uh, so I, you know, I don't think this undermines the idea of these biometrics. But I, 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 if if Samsung did anything wrong, it was being slow to respond to this because at first they said, yeah, this isn't probably a big problem, and that that was the wrong answer. But they finally got the right answer, which is we're going to fix it. Narrator, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to some Google news now. Google says its wireless Stadia controller will work wirelessly with the Chromecast Ultra when Stadia launches on November 19th. A USB-C cable will be required to use the otherwise wireless controller with a computer or a phone. One of the controller's potential features would be to switch between devices without the need for repairing. Google told The Verge it's focusing on getting wireless play right on TV first. The Google Stadia controller also will not work with Bluetooth headphones, at least not at launch. Now, here I will uh, take a little schadenfreude because Google <laughs> made a big deal. Google themselves made a big deal about how the big advantage to their controller was that it connected by Wi-Fi, uh, and so you wouldn't even have to unplug it or anything. You just change your game from your phone to the TV, and the controller goes with it, which it won't do at launch. Granted, it'll get there, but this, this kind of undermines the whole point of this controller. Uh, yeah. No, you want to know what? Uh, 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 if you're like, oh, no, don't worry, it'll eventually get to where it needs to go. And so far, we've gotten two announcements with Stadia where, don't <laughs> worry, eventually we're going to get to negative latency. Eventually, we're going to be yeah. able to do these. It's wireless with a couple of things. Yeah. Just not with other things. With, really with one thing. Just the <laughs> one thing. And but just, trust us. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah, this full future. I don't know. Uh, uh, I think uh, yeah. Google uh, get ahead of their skis uh, sometimes with these. Launch. This is, you know, this is the early launch. This is the Founders Edition launch that you have to pay more for. Uh, but yeah, yeah uh, you know, it's not officially launching till next year. So I'm sure it'll all be fine by then. Uh, here's something good that Google is doing, temporarily increasing the amount it pays for discovery of exploits and site isolation. Uh, it also explained, or sorry, expanded its vulnerability reward program to include bugs in Blink, uh, the engine that Chrome uses to render HTML. Site isolation was strengthened in Chrome 77. It's meant to stop one website from accessing passwords or sensitive data from another site accessed through Chrome browser at the same time. So they used to share a lot of resources, and that would cause the ability for, for one tab to access another tab. Now they isolate them, and they say, look, it has to be coming from the same site that is in this tab for it to work. And that helps stop a lot of these vulnerabilities. Uh, however, in Chrome 77, site isolation added protection for exploits coming through compromised Blink rendering engine as well, which would have been one way to get past that. Uh, so now, you, even if the rendering engine got compromised, they're able to stop any kind of exploit through the rendering engine. In addition, password-triggered site isolation has been enabled for 99% of Android devices with at least two gigabytes of RAM. If you're like, well, wait, why isn't it on everything like it is on the desktop? It takes a bigger hit on your phone 
in performance. So they're only triggering it when you enter a password, which they think is the largest security threat for this kind of attack. Uh, well, you know, it, it's always good uh, to see proactive stories about security, right? As opposed to... Uh, of oh, definitely. It's out of the barn. I do. This does give me the idea that if they're increasing the pay, that they must think this is a line of attack that is at least being researched by people as a way to get in. Uh, and so they're trying to stay in front of it. But like you say, that's pro proactive and, and that's good. Much, much prefer that. I would rather that a company, specifically one that that really does need to be security focused and conscious like Google uh, uh, is is there on the front uh, painting it red and saying, look, this is what we want to guard against. So, yes, we are tipping our hand as to what we think might be a problem in the future. But guess what? We're going to get more of the good guys getting paid on this than the bad guys who are engineering whatever they're going to engineer. And this, this is a tiny, tiny security threat in, in reality. Uh, this doesn't happen very often. It's not even guarded against in a lot of other browsers, including Safari, because it's considered such a small threat. So uh, another reason to, to give Google a little tip of the hat here for, for staying, on, staying as far in front of the game uh, as they can. Microsoft announced 10 new AI for accessibility grants. Among the recipients are Objective Ed, which TechCrunch said is making a system that uh, compares what a child says they are reading to what the Braille display they're reading says and offers corrections when necessary. An iPad uh, powers the Braille display and Azure powers the comparisons. Another recipient is called Smart Ear. It alerts deaf users of things like doorbells or alarms through their smartphone. The City University of London is working on a project that personalizes object recognition. So, for instance, it can tell a user not just that it sees a mug, but whether or not the user's uh, it's the user's mug or not. And finally, Abilitrek lets users rate and review the accessibility of the business and Eve, a system for generating automatic live subtitles, as well as Mappenhood. Developing a navigation app for the blind and low vision viewers and more. Yeah, there's a, there's about uh, I don't know what was it ten or so of these uh, these projects that, that got funding uh, from Microsoft and, and as we heard you don't have to use anything but Azure. Uh, they are trying to get you to use the the benefits of Azure in your project, but you can use iPads, you can use stuff like that if you're not uh, if, as long as you're using Azure for part of it. Uh, and I, you know back to that Braille one you were talking about, that is something that is time intensive usually because there has to be a teacher there to correct the student. Uh, and what this does is takes that out. It makes it easier for the student to practice their reading uh, because the computer can see what they're supposed to be uh, getting from the Braille, compare it to what they should be uh, reading and, and correct them as they go, which, which makes it more efficient. Uh, that, that's a great project. Yeah, there's so many, there's so many of, as these continue to roll out accessibility um, advancements, you know, I, I think a lot of us sort of clueless people who don't have accessibility issues of the, of this nature go like, wow, really? That didn't exist before? No, it didn't. Um, and it's, it's heartwarming to, to, to hear about how, you know, life is getting better for the rest of us. You know, there, there is probably a, a really good, you know, book to be written about what smartphones and smart devices, tablets and everything have done for accessibility. Because it, it, it seems as if I've read far more stories of, uh, uh, of stuff like that in, in recent years than I did the previous. I can see Tom looking behind him to I was find to that accessibility book. book. Uh, it's not exactly what you're talking about, but yeah. if someone were to write that kind of book, I mean, Shelly has done, she's done a lot of the work on that in, in writing actual tips up uh, for people. So yeah, I was like, it, we're, we're awful close there. If, if there doesn't already exist a book like that out there. Well, speaking of advancements, Sentence is a startup that has begun marketing technology to eliminate buttons. It says it's working with Asus and two other smartphone makers. The system uses ultrasonic waves to detect touches or presses or swipes in a variety of materials, including metal. Asus uses it in a phone it made for gamers in cooperation with Tencent that was released uh, earlier this year in the summer. The top edges of the phone can be used as triggers in games. Sentence is also developing a virtual jog wheel and a virtual shutter button to focus a phone's camera. The system works with a custom chip that generates the sound waves and algorithms on the chip that 
and interpret gestures. The company hopes to expand beyond smartphones to watches and cars and include materials like wood and leather. This is fascinating. I, I, when I first saw this, started reading the story, I thought, well, you know, a lot of these phones and, you know, the iPhone 10 a couple of years ago it got rid of buttons, but it didn't, right? Still got the side buttons. And that's what they're going after is no buttons at all. You, you could be able to hit those side buttons without there being buttons. Uh, let's use metal and wood uh, as, as the detection surface by using ultrasound. Uh, and it's all about the machine learning. Uh, it sounds like they've got the hardware to create the sound waves uh, pretty pretty much underway. It's all about making that algorithm so that you can easily detect what's a button press and what isn't. Uh, because you want to make sure that it, you don't get false presses when people are just picking up their phones. And this yeah. might be better at that than an actual physical button because it can tell the difference when a phone is being picked up versus when it actively is being pressed. I, I know that this is not the hardware or, or research that we are talking about with this specific startup, but I will say we need similar advancements in making sure that a virtual button feels similar, if not better, than a physical button. Which is, So I mean, you know that you pressed it. Yes. Yeah, like, yeah. That is a psychological thing that for me specifically, and it's not all buttons now, but the important ones, the ones where uh, I, I want to feel satisfaction that, okay, like, am I just not touching this right? Like, I need some kind of, like, burp, burp. I was always Although, impressed with the haptics on the on the old iPhones. Yeah. that, Because when the phone would be off and I would touch the button, I'd be like, oh, wow, that's right. That's not actually a button. That's just a depression with yeah. haptic feedback. So, yeah, I wonder, I wonder how much they can do that, especially if they're working with wood and stuff. This feels like one of those advancements that people like us are like, yeah, but without a physical button, is it really going to work the way it's supposed to work? Are you even going to know when you've depressed it properly? I, you know, we used to say that about mice, right? You know, left click, right click kind of thing. Mm. Now I got a trackpad where I do all sorts of things without clicking anything. Um, you know, it, it, you know, it's just, it's just sort of my finger being, uh, being detected. And so, yeah, I wonder, I wonder if in five years we'll kind of laugh about the fact that everybody talked about physical buttons and what we were all going to do if we got rid of them. I love the idea of different material besides metal, though. That's really cool. Because yeah, that's yeah. something that has never been – I mean, we just don't you know, have phones that have wood uh, – you know, bezels. You just yeah, don't. we've had wooden cases for computers and mobile yeah. devices before, yeah, but that's true. but yeah, this this takes it a little farther because now that wooden surface can be used as a, a control surface. I know a lot of people like wood finishes in their cars, and now now your control surface in your car could be you know could be entirely wood. Uh, yeah, you know, I I, I agree with you, Sarah. I, I I do think that at a certain point we'll look back and be like, oh, ha ha ha, physical button. <laughs> Uh, uh, what a, what a relic of our past. Uh, I do think that there is, you have to do it right though, because there is an Absolutely, element. Absolutely. Like, yes. There right. has to be a way for you to know that you're hitting the right place. I, I'm actually curious if anyone's tried this Asus phone with the triggers, uh, on the side, which is sentence first actual shipping product with their technology in it. Uh, do you, do you get some haptic feedback from that? Is it easy to tell where those trigger buttons are? Uh, if anyone has used that, Chinese phone, let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Yeah. And if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, don't forget we have another show in the company's portfolio called Daily Tech Headlines. You can get that at dailytechheadlines.com. Netflix is dead. Oh, wait, no, it's not. Well, the stock market likes it, but nobody else does. That that summarizes the past five years, maybe 15 years of, of Netflix news. Uh, but... <laughs> We have another Netflix earnings report. Netflix beat earnings expectations, but missed on U.S. subscribers. So everyone's happy. They can get to turn this into whatever story they want. Uh, the company added 517,000 U.S. subscribers and 6.26 million international subscribers, but analysts had expected 802,000 U.S. subscribers and only 6.05 million international. So they beat on international, and they had a pretty big miss on U.S. subscribers. Uh, Netflix still blaming their price changes on the slow U.S. growth, uh, 2.1 million additions in the United States so far this year, compared to 4.1 million at this point last year. But hey, average revenue per user is up 16.5%. So it's not hurting their bottom line, and the international growth seems to keep making up the difference. Starting next quarter, the company is going to break out revenue and subscribers regionally. So we'll get to hear 
what the Asia Pacific number, the Europe number, Middle East and Africa, Latin America, and US Canada numbers are separately. Uh, Netflix projects 7.6 million additional global subs next year compared to 8.8 .8 million for the same quarter last year. I'm sorry, next quarter. Uh, so they are projecting fewer global subs uh, than they were than they got last year. So there is no disputing that Netflix is growing, but it's growing slower than it was. Now, CEO Reed Hastings said the raft of new streaming service competitors would generate modest headwinds in the near term. So he's saying it's the price change right now and it's going to be competitors. So don't expect us to have stellar numbers, but he thinks long term Netflix is going to be fine. And here's why the upcoming arrival of services like Disney Plus, Apple TV Plus, HBO Max and Peacock increase competition. But Hastings says we are all small compared to linear TV. While the new competitors have some great titles, especially catalog titles, none have the variety, diversity, and quality of new original programming that we are producing around the world. Hastings thinks they will all steal market share from traditional TV. He says that's what happened when cable channels came along. They didn't steal from each other. They stole from broadcast. That's what's going to happen here. We're not going to steal from each other. We're going to steal from cable. He says the likely outcome from the launch of these new services will be to accelerate the shift from linear TV to on-demand consumption of entertainment. He said Netflix will continue to take bold swings, but it won't chase every deal on the table, basically saying, OK, we've, we've spent some money on some stinkers. We're going to try to be more select. And he threw some shade at Disney. He said, uh, I think that is every bit as valuable as drafting off a bunch of different franchises and waiting for them to burn out. Oh, uh, oh get Lucasfilm, some Marvel. Mm -hmm. Shots fired. Uh, he hammered away on Stranger Things, Martin Scorsese, Michael Bay, Noah Baumbach, also mentioned Seinfeld, uh, as, as sort of examples of how they've got great content. Don't worry about Netflix. Now, Netflix needs more hits than that. No matter what it does, there's going to be pressure on domestic subs with new services until we get that wave of cord cutters hitting the inflection point. He, I, I agree with Hastings. Like once people start leaving cable in, in larger numbers, then all of these services can survive and, and grow. International growth is gonna keep Netflix going while he waits for that. But to prevail when that influx comes, Netflix is gonna need to be seen as HBO. That's what he's trying to describe themselves. We have the greatest originals. We're not just relying on back catalog and old intellectual property, but it's gonna need more than Stranger Things and Scorsese for that. Yes, although do you think that they are not on the road? That they, they seem to be, uh, they seem to have had a fairly good track record of being able to push out a a big uh, uh, everybody's talking about it kind of series, uh, you know. And 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 we're we just had a rash of them, like with you know Russian Doll season two will be another big uh, uh, thing. So I don't know. I, I do think that Netflix certainly has spent a ton of money on uh, content. Right. But I don't know if anybody is as far ahead of the game or as metrics minded as Netflix is to take educated guesses. And I think that's his big slam on Disney is like, all right, well, you did it the, the caveman way. Uh, uh, look, here's this gigantic old thing. We'll, we'll buy the old thing and turn out new versions of it. We're doing the, 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 the super new way of, all right, well, we're going to give David Spade a deal because for whatever reason, we know that. Kids six through adults 60 all love Adam Sandler movies to watch together, and that's their strategy. I I think, yes, they are on the road. They don't have enough going right now to counteract their slowing growth, though. If they were more solidly on the road, we'd see stronger growth from them, whether they have a price increase or not. Look at HBO. Uh, HBO is, is, you know, everyone thought, oh, what are they going to do after Game of Thrones? But now people are talking about Big Little Eyes, Watchmen. Like, they keep coming, Righteous Gemstones. They keep coming, yeah. uh, Succession. They keep, you know what I'm saying? Whereas yeah. Netflix, it's like, oh, Stranger Things is done. Well, I don't have to watch Netflix for another couple months till my my favorite show comes back. And that's that's what I'm talking about. That they, has they, not they, always been the case, though, for HBO. HBO is on a hot streak now. But sure, I, sure. I, I do sure. think that these things happen cyclically and what netflix has that hbo does not because hbo is one clearinghouse right it's like they have their their sunday slots now they've expanded it into monday where prestige television lives and they cleared the dance floor for that netflix doesn't care if you subscribe because 
you like these tween rom-coms or you like stand-up comedy or you like prestige hour-long dramas. They are there for all of it, and they are constantly trying to micro-target. And that's you're right. The numbers are the numbers are the numbers. But if their play is content, I still think they're ahead of the game there. You know, Netflix's argument that really the enemy is still uh, the linear cable networks. I mean, yes, that's true. That's that's certainly true for U.S. subscribers. Uh, And the tide will change, shift, shift. And when that happens, Netflix is, yeah, I feel like they're going to win in the short term. But it's what we always talk about is, well, okay, when you have a lot of choice as a cord cutter and you kind of realize... Well, hold on a second. I don't really want all of these channels. I want just certain things that are important to me. I don't think Netflix wins in the long term because the, the, it will have uh, too many competitors. And and right now, the perception of Netflix isn't what Reed Hastings needs it to be. He wants it to be prestige programming. He wants it to be, we're the place with the best originals, no matter what your taste. You like rom-coms? You like Christmas prints? Uh, you, you like, <laughs> you like you know, Seinfeld high-level mysteries? reruns? It's all, all here. And that's really not how people talk about Netflix. They talk about it as a place to just sit down and watch something. The, per- the perception is stuck in the past of Netflix, the DVD purveyor of, they're the place that has everything. And that's why you see people complaining like, they're losing friends. Netflix isn't going to be worth something anymore. He needs to shift that perception. I mean, but it it is there on some level, right? Like, mm-hmm. like, like it is, and maybe this is just my own little Twitterati uh, <laughs> chamber, but you know, it seems like it's still like it seems like five times this year a Netflix show just totally took over my Twitter timeline, and everybody was talking about it, mm-hmm. and now I had to sit down and binge watch eight episodes of some random show. <laughs> yeah, Did I, you enjoy that random show though? Because that's that's. Oft, that's the kicker. Oft I did. Oft I did. Uh, uh, not always, but oft. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I, I think he needs to ha- have that happen more. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. So that when that influx comes, people are choosing Netflix for multiple reasons. And don't get me wrong, Netflix is perfectly positioned to make that happen. Uh, but but they haven't, they haven't, they aren't as far ahead of the game as I think maybe I expected them to be. That's all. Well, but but also this would be either this would be the scariest moment that then is as Reed Hastings hopes, not as bad as it seems with all the the, the barbarians at the gates right now, or it's really uh, the beginning of a huge problem where subscriber fatigue eventually starts eating at Netflix. Yeah, even even if they have the worst version of what I'm talking about, though, he's right. People are going to start leaving cable, and and just the rising tide will lift all these boats. The, the I, I I go back to what we started this conversation with. The problem isn't the competitors. The problem isn't Disney Plus. Uh, that 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 is not going to be the challenge. I don't think. Here's the other thing that you know you that is not yet dawned that will be a a larger issue in uh, the next five years. Sports rights deals. We are we are at the point now where so one of these companies, and it might be Netflix if they want to get into more live stuff uh, or, or live stuff at all, that they're going to make a pitch for something uh, yeah. in, in, in that realm. It won't be Netflix, but as soon as sports becomes perceived as something you can easily get without cable, even though really right now it is, uh, that that's when that big influx is going to happen. You're right. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Netflix stories and others are encouraged. You can submit any story you like and then vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We also have a lively Facebook group. Come on in, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. I'm sorry, I just noticed Beatmaster in the chat room wrote, why do you think they say Netflix and chill? They need future customers. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Paul, the software entomologist, those are his words, says the LinkedIn events announcement, which we talked about on yesterday's show, is right on the heels of meetup.com announcing that they are exploring charging for RSVPs. He uh, links us to a Forbes article where, yes, it would actually upset a lot of meetup.com subscribers. Paul says, several of the meetups that I attend are now ready to ditch meetup.com. I don't think meetup.com is that differentiated, except it has the bulk of meetup traffic right now. A new competitor could swoop in and take it over pretty easily, I think, especially if that uh, had a lot of existing traffic like LinkedIn does. 
that's a really good point. I hadn't even thought about meetup.com. Uh, they, they could be the roadkill uh, more so than, than anything else on, on the way to uh, LinkedIn's uh, adding of, of an incremental feature. Uh, I didn't realize that, that as many people were still using meetup.com as are. So thank you, Paul, for that. Thanks, Paul. And shout out to our patrons at the master and grandmaster levels, including Kevin S. Morgan, Paul Reese, Michael Akins. Thanks to you and everybody else who supports us. Thanks also to Justin Robert Young for being with us this fine Thursday. Justin, what's been going on since we saw you last? Uh, well, obviously, we had a big debate uh, on uh, or this week on CNN and uh, co-hosted by the New York Times, and I covered it in depth. Uh, not only that, but also uh, we had a breakdown of the AOC endorsement of Bernie Sanders. We had Dave Leventhal from the Center for Public Integrity to break down all of the Q3 fundraising uh, uh, money and some of the troubling trends for a few candidates that uh, those revealed and had a great chat with Andrew Heaton. You might say, wow, is that a week's worth of content? No, friends. It was all on one episode of Politics, Politics, Politics. That's the most recent one. And we had another episode this week where Tom texted me his thoughts on Brexit, as he is off to do. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and check it out. Uh, politics, Politics, Politics. Find it wherever you listen to fine podcasts. Yes, the Harris Tweeds and Warren Commissioners and everyone are welcome. Go find that show. All right. Uh, we have new Patreon rewards. Uh, become a member of DTNS and you can get them. Behind the scenes chats, peek at our show rundown as we develop it. And on November 1st, everyone at the $2 level or up gets a PDF copy of the DTNS cookbook with recipes from us and some listeners. So you need to go sign up right now. Patreon.com slash DTNS. We also welcome your feedback. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We'd also love for you to join us live if you can. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Blair Bazdarich. And if his internet happens, Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>